Well, whilst COVID-19 isn't particularly good news anywhere in the world, we are starting to see big discrepancies between those countries which have been hit hard and those that seem to have escaped the worst of it. Why is that? And when it's all over, will we find a similar discrepancy between those who bounce back relatively quickly and those economies who suffer the consequences of the current downturn for many years to come? Today, which economy is handling the virus the best? I'm Phil Dobby. Welcome to the Debunking Economics Podcast with Professor Steve Keen. Well, in the US, we know that at least 3 million people lost their job in a week, a couple of weeks back. So uh, we wait this week for the updated figures, but we know it's going to be a lot more than that. And of course, most of those people will lose their private health cover that came with their jobs just as they need it. In the UK, there are very tame predictions that unemployment will reach 8%, which is double what it was in the three months to, to January. Australia, I suspect, is just at the beginning of the journey, but the economy is pretty much locked down there as well. So layoffs will follow as product uh, productivity decreases, well, uh, production generally uh, disappears. So just how bad is this going to be? Uh, Steve, uh, how bad do you, do you reckon? And, and is the ensuing unemployment rate the big issue? Because that's, of course, uh, what is going to stop a, a big bounce back. If, if people have lost their jobs, they've got to find jobs, uh, that could be a very long and torturous process. So I, I imagine that's a key number, isn't it? Okay, well, this, 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 this is actually one of those chicken and egg questions, which comes first, the supply or demand? And the answer in a monetary economy is the demand comes first. This is uh, Say's law in reverse. Demand creates its own supply fundamentally. Now, if you have... Uh, something of the order, and it's quite likely to get this high, 30% of the population out of a job, uh, then you're going to rely upon on the, on the remaining 70% of the workforce. So let's say uh, providing additional demand to slowly stimulate those people back into work. It isn't going to work. This is one of those real cases where, you know, you've got an engine and you've got to kickstart it, frankly, and the kickstart is the, the government, just like the government needs to be the, the uh, provider of last resort and when we actually have to shut capitalism down to, with through the lockdowns we're doing to to uh, prevent this virus spreading even more rapidly, uh, we need the gov- we, we need demand to come in and rapidly from the government sector. And if yeah. it doesn't, we're in for a long and extended depression. Well, it seems like there's two ways you can do that. One is the way that's uh, being taken in Ireland and Australia and the UK, where they are trying to stop companies laying people off. So if they are proroguing workers, they're basically saying, well, we're going to cover a proportion of your pay on the basis then that those workers will still be employed by you. You can uh, turn the switch factories or whatever it is you do will start working again uh, and uh, and all is good. That's very different to the approach taken in the United States, isn't it, where they're basically mm. just saying, well, no, let's, let's do the helicopter money approach. Not enough of it, but let's give money to everybody, uh, put it into their bank accounts. So there's absolutely no incentive for companies to, to hang on to people, which is why we saw that three million increase in a week a couple of weeks back. Yeah, I mean, you need both. I mean, you've got to you've got to provide money to people so that they can pay their fundamental bills. So I'm I actually, as you know, one of our earlier podcasts and one and earlier a post on the site as well. I argued in favour of uh, a modern jubilee, yeah. and that really says direct payments to everybody so they can pay all their meet all their financial commitments, uh, even though they've been you know they've they've lost their employment. But it's also necessary for people not to lose their jobs. You want to. You want to say, okay, you, you're going into, uh, I think it was Jane Carrow who made this analogy, you're going to intensive care. This is not hibernation. Uh, the the, the hibern- hibernating bear uh, has built up fat before the, before it goes into hibernation, mm. voluntarily goes into hibernation, lives off the fat while sleeping and comes out trim and ready to eat the next meal. This is not anything like that. This is intensive care. You are putting into an induced coma. Uh, we're providing... And you, what you want on the other the other side of the coma, you want as little damage as possible done to the actual body corporate of the economy, and that means you have to say people keep their jobs. Nobody gets sacked. Right, and that Ireland, Australia, the UK, and I'm sure there are other countries are trying that approach, aren't they? So I mean, it, it, this uh, perhaps you know countries didn't respond fast enough, uh, but this came from from nowhere, and we uh, clearly weren't prepared. But you'd have to say, you know, for uh, you know capitalist economies to respond in a way where they're starting to pay people now not to work is, is, a, is a big shift in thinking. And it seems to have happened relatively quickly. So we've got to take some, uh, some light from that, I guess. We do. Uh, but at the same time, this has repeated the same thing with the financial crisis. Mm. I mean, you know, uh, I don't have to explain to you that I was warning about the crisis before it happened. You, I was haranguing you about it yeah. um, before we started our podcasts. Um, I, I saw this kind of coming as of December, about 18, 2005. 
if I want to date it correctly. It's 2005, 2006, 2005. Whenever. Okay. Now, at the same time, you had people like Ben Bernanke saying everything's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the, the, and the, the, the Fed prediction of the Federal Reserve 2008 was going to be a fabulous year with all basically telling politicians to sit back and take the credit for a great year and wham, 2007 August strikes and we have the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. Mm. Now, in that situation, the response of the so-called authority, the people supposedly in charge of the place was, and this is pretty much quoting uh, um, the, the uh, I was in Hank Paulson, the then US uh, Treasury Secretary, is that we didn't want capitalism to fail on our watch. So these bastards didn't see it coming, but when it hit, holy hell, panic, and they did the exact opposite of everything that their training and then their bias and class interests had told them to do beforehand. This is similar. So how do we be like that hibernating bear then? How do we, uh, in, in future, how do we have that fat so that we can get through things like this. Is, is that possible? Is it even, even possible to do that? Yes, it is possible, but it's the opposite of what's likely to happen. Again, I mean, even the, thank God the Germans are stupid enough to put their heads up and say something as ridiculous as this before we even get through the crisis. I've forgotten which particular German leader it was. They came out with a statement uh, about a week ago saying that as soon as this is over, we've got to return to austerity. No, you don't. <laughs> austerity is a starving bear going into hibernation. Mm. Okay. And this is, okay. We, we the whole idea that government should be saving money rather than saving, than building resources for a rainy day is nonsense. Yeah. It's the resources you need, not the bloody money. They can create that with a flick of a switch, well, as we're seeing now. Very easy for Germany to say that, of course, because they haven't got the same uh, death rate that we're seeing in other parts of Europe. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk uh, in, in the next podcast, actually, about the yeah. future of the yeah. EU out of all of this. But Donald Trump uh, is uh, wanting to push ahead with his infrastructure project. So as well as all the money he's, he's pushed forward, which is a, a, a sizable proportion of, uh, of GDP, uh, which is, is now coming from, from government funds, he's now also wanting to spend $2 trillion on his infrastructure project, which he's been pushing since he, he, he got into power. But he's now saying uh, 0% Interest now is the time to borrow all this money. New Zealand also want to do that. Shovel ready projects, they're saying, so uh, people can get into work straight away. So is that is that sensible? The, the question to me yes, is yes, yes, yes. But who takes up the shovel? Are you ready to take up a shovel, Steve? <laughs> Not with my arthritic hands, no. <laughs> well, um, and that's sort of the then, point. You've got to have the right people in the right job. So that, that's why, for example, sacking eighty percent of the staff of the. Uh, of the, uh, of the pandemic staff of the uh, Centre for Disease, Disease Control wasn't the brightest of ideas that he had about a year and a half ago. Yeah. You know, so this, 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 this trimming the fat stuff, this is when you – there's no such thing as a thin bear going into hibernation. A thin bear going into hibernation is a dead bear. So is there any country you can look at and say they've handled this particularly well? Um, yes. In fact, the one that I'm currently in, Thailand, is one that I think can make a fairly strong claim on that front. Uh and, and also, uh, there's I think I think Taiwan can make a strong claim. Singapore, a lot a lot of these countries have one thing in common: they experience SARS and they're Asian. Yeah. And uh, and this was a major factor. They they knew that they had to have, for example, the capacity to produce N95 masks on mass. And just to give you an idea of my daily uh, daily routine over here in Thailand, it starts with ten o'clock, going to one of the local bulk food outlets and uh, wearing a mask, standing in a line of a whole lot of other people also wearing masks, and buying four masks for the princely sum of 10 baht, which for those who don't speak Thai is 50 US cents. Uh, and that'll, by the way, that is a, a government-mandated price, and it includes a 20% markup profit for the firms making, making the masks. So it just shows that a, an orchestrated a part private, part uh, government sector response can work dramatically well and slow down the spread of the disease. And that's why the countries that are actually closest to China physically are the ones with the best performance right now. Right. Whereas the Europeans, the Americans, total disaster. But I mean, there's, there's, there's several elements to this, aren't there? One is, yes, okay, you've got to you've got to protect yourself and have masks. And obviously, we've got the issue in the UK where there's not e enough of that basic stuff, even for healthcare workers who really are on the front line. But the other one is this this question of of isolation, mm -hmm. uh, so that you you're not seeing the infection spreading. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm sort of surmising that in Asia they might have been swifter to respond to that as well by stopping movement between countries and within countries. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, China was one. Of, China was China. China. Uh, it, it's great to see when they'll you know 
pundits will criticise a particular country, its political system led to this decision, and then do precisely the same bloody thing with a different political system shortly after. So China denied there was any problem, uh, suppressed the group of doctors who were actually warning about the outbreak of a new bomb of pneumonia, uh, and, and did everything they could to pretend it wasn't happening. And then once they realised it was happening, it hit the screws in terms of people's capacity to go out into the public in a dramatic way. Now, America, what do they do? It's going to be all over in two weeks, only 15 cases. Yeah. Absolute same garbage, you know. Uh, but they didn't do the follow-up that was done by the um, by the Chinese, which is a total lockdown. And the lockdown has been dramatically effective. So the the, the logic, um, to me, and I'm, I'm, I think this is the, you know, I think this is now being accepted, isn't it, as, as the general logic for all of this. Lock down mm-hmm. everybody so you stop the, in, the infection. Test people so you can see who's got it and be sure that we know that once you've had it, you're immune. And that's the, the, the scientists still add on that. But if we know that, then those people can gradually get to work. And so we can. But we will still need to uh, in, ensure that we have borders controlled because we need to if, we, if we're controlling it within our country, we need to make sure people coming into our country are following the, the same approach as well. You can see that as what as as a logical way out of this. I'm just wondering how many countries are going to uh, follow that follow that approach, suspecting in Asia more so than perhaps in the West. Yeah, I mean, again, it's partly the the, um, the sort of state corporate uh, capitalist culture of Asia is coming to its uh, to its rescue. And like I made, I saw one of my patrons uh, was worried about me, but apparently supporting a totalitarian regime with this particular comment. Hi, Stefanos. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, what I said, in fact, was that China will, Z will use this to legitimise his own rule. Yeah. And do it very successfully. But the, the, the combined corporate and, uh, and status system that exists generally throughout Asia, Marx actually referred to Asia as, as in, it being uh, uh, irrigation capitalism and needing a centralised state to control the irrigation. So it goes right back I mean, well, well before the communist period that if you're going to have a, a country country running predominantly on irrigation, you needed an organisation to link things together and there was an acceptance of a state having a powerful role. The Chinese Communist Party has probably pushed that further than that, far, far further than flight even under the, um, under the emperors, but it's, it's, that's why it's successful. People have accepted this culturally for a long, long time. Well, this, this difference between cultures is interesting, isn't it? Because the, in, in the US, there was this denial for a long time. In fact, I think there still is, reading some shocking articles uh, from the US, but also from Australia as well, where the, I think this denial is still rampant about how far this thing can spread and it's not going to hit us as, as much as it's hitting anywhere else. In the UK, mm. they needed – so in, in Asia, yes, there's sort of like a more uh, government-down approach where people do what they're told. In the UK, uh, they don't do that, so they needed more enforcement before it worked. In Sweden, we're told they've got a more laissez-faire approach, they say, because people are voluntarily socially distancing, and the, uh, the, the incline rate for infections and morbidity is much less there than the rest of Europe, although you could argue, well, perhaps they're a little less connected being uh, stuck off uh, – uh, up, up on that uh, on that peninsula that uh, we don't go to unless we're going there. Uh, so, I mean, that might be their geography might be part of it as well. But it's it, it's showing the difference in cultures, isn't it? And uh, yeah, th- those countries that are less willing to be controlled right now are the ones that are suffering the most. Yeah, like I'll, I'll go back to China again because I was very lucky to uh, have had a very odd experience of China in uh, December, in November of nineteen eighty one. Uh, I, uh, I, I suggested the concept of a seminar between Australian and but between Australian journalists and those of any other country to compare coverage on a year on over a year to see how much the issues behind the events are being covered by the respective media, and that was picked up by Jocelyn Shea, who was then the director of the Australia China Council, and at that time uh, they were having discussions with the Chinese. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, j- journalists, uh, all, all China Journalists Association, and they rapidly agreed to the idea of running a seminar between Australian and Chinese journalists. And I ran that seminar in November of 1981. Now, uh, as part of that, we did a tour of China. And uh, before we before we left the country, there were two pieces of economic data. It's me, me and nine Australian journalists who came along, including uh, the son of Manning Clark, Andrew Clark, and a few other fairly prominent Australian journalists. And uh, before we left, we did a caucus of a group of nine, and we were stunned by a piece of data coming out of China saying that uh, industrial light industry production had increased by 17%, and heavy industry had fallen by 8%. 
and it just did not compute. You, you need heavy industry to produce light. How the hell did one go up and the other go down so much? We went through, all through China asking all sorts of questions, including coming back to this one all the time. Every question we ever asked was answered by, we followed the directive of the Central Committee, the Communist Party of China. Absolutely every question. What did you have for breakfast? I followed the directive of the Central Committee of the <laughs> Communist Party of China. Um, this, What that meant was, and I finally worked at the logic of this out, was that the Communist Party at that stage was 30 million people out of a country of 1 billion people. So roughly one in every 30 people was a member of the Communist Party. You didn't know who it was. Mm. So you simply, the only You're way to watched. make sure... You're being watched. And the only way to make sure that you didn't get persecuted when things went wrong, as they inevitably would, was to say, I followed the directive of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. Now, what that meant was a slogan would start at the top level of the country and percolate down through the command system down to the region. The slogan might be, for example, and this was a common issue back then, uh, the, the dominant faction of the Communist Party would be the pro-grain faction. So the slogan would be promote grain. That would get down to the ground level. What would happen? The, the local communist official would tell the, tell the peasants to rip up the legume crops, all the protein stuff, and plant grain. Mm. One or two years later, kids would be born with protein deficiency disease. And I'm talking, I've actually seen this. Yeah. Okay. When we, I saw kids and these weird faces, and I said, this is quackajour. And it was. There would then be a revolt. The peasants would knife the local communist official. They'd go back up the command trial. The peasants are revolting. It'd flip who's in control, promote, promote uh, legumes. That would come down. Why do they rip up grain? So it, this is a long, long period, <laughs> but punchline is that we asked, why did you reduce, why did light industry increase and heavy industry fall? The answer was, well, the Communist Party, CCP, put out a directive to promote light industry. Yes, so what did you do? quote, unquote, from the guy who has introduced us as the economic boss of Shanghai. We stripped heavy industry factories and turned them into light industry. Now, to bring this forward to what's happened today, Communist Party says isolate people. What happens on the ground level? People go around welding up the doors of apartment yeah. blocks. Okay. And that that is now, the, that is the danger, isn't it? That, uh, that, that but it's it, also working. This this, mm. this 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 this. Unfortunately, people starve. People will have died of starvation inside those apartment blocks. Yeah, I have no doubt. But the thing is, isolation like a brick. And what has happened is that China's doubling rate has fallen from two days to double to five hundred days to double. So two questions come out of this. Okay, so that's effective. So I've got I've got two questions. One, and, and these are questions which are sort of uh, commonly being asked now in, in the media. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, is it that bad, really? Uh, and uh, and the and the second, you know, and, and are we going too far mm -hmm. in terms of uh, of how we're enforcing it? So on the you know and the common one for is it that bad, really? You know, lots of people die from flu uh, every year. In fact, more than have died from COVID nineteen in 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 most countries. But of course, they're ignoring the fact that this is exponential growth. And if you if you don't stop it, that's then, the issue. Yeah, yeah. And but the that's other the, issue. the other one is um, yeah, are we are we going overboard with this? So uh, an example in the UK is uh, outside London is uh, London is, is is the epicenter for the UK and it's yep. far worse than for example towns in the north of England where you might actually find there's, there's, there's nobody so if you'd locked down London earlier then you might have been able to have less stringent approaches in the rest of the UK where the infection rate is lower or, or non-existent so people could uh, you know you could almost lock those towns down as well and say well okay everyone can go out and go to work and the economy can perform so th I mean that's a valid question isn't it have we gone too far by closing down Everything completely stopping the economy. No, this this this, it, it, this is um, one of the areas where you know it, it's the, the first people who are saying this thing about you know it's just like the flu, don't understand the exponential function, and this is the, mm. this is the problem. If the flu, and uh, this this is a, a great little analogy I saw um, uh, mentioned by a, um, a epidemiologist a couple of days ago, a British one actually, saying that if you have the flu. You are likely to infect, on average, because it is, it is not an average. It's, it's you know waiting super super uh, spreaders with others other people. But on average, one person getting the flu will infect one point three other people. Now that means that over ten cycles of getting the flu, uh, the total number of people who've been infected after ten cycles is fourteen. If you have the coronavirus and we we find a statistical average that one person infects three other people, after ten cycles you will have fifty nine thousand people infected. Now, and and the thing is, we know that this thing uh, takes about 
to, to you can be infected almost immediately for it to actually show symptoms it takes between five days and two weeks. Yeah. The doubling period is running, it seems running about six days. But, does to, but, over- but it does seem to level off, doesn't it? I, I, mean, I hear you, and I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. All I'm being is the yeah. devil's advocate here, but it does seem to level off. And there's a guy, Charles Einstein, I don't know who he is. He's, uh, I don't know if he's related to Einstein, perhaps he is, but he's got a blog. Uh, he uh, yeah. he points to the, uh, the Diamond Princess, 3,711 people on board, 20 tested positive for the virus. Half of those had the symptoms, 10 died. And yet here we have a boat where everyone sharing the same air conditioning system full of old people half of them are aged over 60 uh, and yet out of 3711 only only 10 people died uh, that, that you know that's a that, that that's a pretty low morbidity rate given that everyone was so it, yeah, in I'm, such I'm, a confined space 10 people die but it, it, it it's it, it may have a, like the, the more the, the mortality rate rate is one thing mm. it's also if you're looking at some of the cases of people who got this damn thing you don't want to get it yeah uh, it, 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 it's those the, 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 the number of deaths, yes, might be the we're talking a death rate of maybe between somewhere between 0.3 to the one, you know, 0.3 of a percent to two percent. We're not really sure of the range. Okay, it's not, it's not something at that level. 0.3 percent is a low death rate, but it's about I think it's about two or three times the death rate from the flu. The trouble is not the death rate itself; it's how fast the death rate grows and how fast you overwhelm yeah. all your. Uh, facilities. Uh, and this is the problem. We don't have enough intensive care units for the number of people who will be infected with this at the peak level of infection. So the medical system will break down. Uh, the people who get it, though, yes, maybe 0.3% will die. Uh, apparently, something could be as high as 15% get severe symptoms, severe enough to be hospitalized. Mm. We can't hospitalize 15% of the population. Um, it, this, this is the overwhelming impact of a very rapid growth, the rate of growth of disease, even if it has a low level of mortality. And it, 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 it's still got a higher level of mortality than the flu, even if you're talking 03 it's still a lot higher than the flu, I believe. And it's going to, the US obviously is going to be hit very hard by this. The UN says their death rate in the US could reach a quarter of a million. Uh, the, in fact, if you look at how, again, if you look at the number of deaths, they are actually tracking, if you take it from uh, when 50 people died uh, and extract from that day, you'll find that the US is actually increasing the, the death rate alarmingly faster than Italy did even and uh, the UK oh my God. even though they can spend big and have spent big to, uh, to, to solve the problem so what's what's gone wrong there well I, <laughs> other than having an idiot in charge <laughs> which, that helps that helps <laughs> um, uh, done done in Kruger effect writ large uh, it's it, the, the medical the state, of, the state of medical health in America in general is appalling. I think this is this is one thing you can say about this is this is testing the the, the uh, veracity of medical systems all around the planet, and America is failing big time. Yeah, uh, this is the best argument possible for needing universal health care in America. The whole idea that it should be not only private but linked to you being employed, as you said earlier. So you lose your job, you lose access to health insurance, therefore you can't even afford to, you know. You can't even afford to be dragged to the front door of the hospital. They'll throw you up because you can't afford to get inside the entrance. It's a, it's a totally inadequate for normal situations and catastrophically bad for this situation. So there's two ways we could come out of this, isn't there? One, one is that, uh, you know, we managed to keep it under control and and therefore everybody looks at this and say, you know, look, it wasn't that bad after all and we just returned to normality. The other way is that we find that it, it is worse than we thought and we have more and more government controls as a result of it and that challenges more our civil liberties and we find that we can't get them back. So we all become like China at the end of this. Either of those scenarios is, is not a good scenario. No, that's right. I mean, the, the most dangerous one probably is the um, the cry wolf syndrome where, you know, somebody cries wolf and it doesn't really happen. So you think, oh, it, it, it's never going to matter. And then the real wolf turns up and it's, you, you don't do anything and you get destroyed. And this is the argument that was put forward by a woman called Laurie Garrett, who was at the time she wrote a journalist. She was the... Um, New York Times uh, medical correspondent, and she spent about a decade researching plagues and evolution of new uh, of, of new um, pathogens and so on. And she uh, argued that there are two, and this is based on very sound, very very, very scholarly research, uh, that there are two main dimensions on which pathogens evolve. One is, of course, transmissibility. The other is how virulent the pathogen is. 
And normally, in, in an evolutionary sense, when one particular attribute of, a, of a, uh, an organism or a, a it's hard to call the virus a life form because it's not actually alive. But if it involves in one direction strongly, so it becomes much more virulent, for example, it's likely to become less transmissible. It sacrifices some genetic capability to go in the opposite direction. Equally, if it becomes more, uh, more transmissible, then it becomes less virulent. But the odds were always there that one pathogen would evolve in both directions at the one time. You would get more virulent and more transmissible. Now, this we're realizing that it's not as, it certainly isn't as, as uh, virulent as SARS, for example, let alone Ebola, but it is more transmissible by a large margin than either of those diseases. Not as transmissible as the measles, thank God, which is uh, the average infection rate for the measles is one person will affect 20 others. This looks like being about three, but it's also got a, a, a higher death rate than the normal flu. I think the normal flu has got a death rate of about 0.1%, so one in a 1,000 will die. Uh, this looks about probably we might be lucky it's 0.3. It could be high as, as 2%. We really still don't know. But it has got both those characteristics, and the most dangerous is the transmissibility and the fact, of course, you can transmit it without, having, uh, without, without actually having the flu, or having symptoms. It's, yeah. You, that is the danger. But do you think so, we do you think we will get it in check though, and over over what time frame? Uh, well, again, I'm, I'm talking outside of my area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fantasy, but, but, but as I, as, I a, as, a, as a layman, you know, we're all entitled to an opinion. What what's yeah, your yeah. thought? I, I I think we will uh, get it under control, and probably in the next six months. That's that's right. a, that's a guess. And in that six months, which brings me on to my second point, we will have had so many civil liberties taken away. Are we going to have to fight to get them back again? And uh, the reason I ask that question is because uh, at least the media is covering this, but there's a bit of, you know, what people are calling heavy handedness by police. They're not actually uh, sort of like tackling people to the ground, but stopping people and asking where they're going. Uh, you, you know, when they're they're driving to take a form of exercise in a in a less congested part of uh, of the country you would have thought it's not doing any harm but they're following by the, the the letter of the law i guess they've got nothing else to do because there's not many break-ins at the moment because everyone's at home <laughs> so, <laughs> and nobody dares break in because they're breaking the home if somebody's got the disease exactly yeah. so so i, I mean yeah. you know you can but you can see uh, it's not it's not police state but you can see how we're heading in that direction well i i think we i think we do have uh we have an excessive concept of our own uh liberty on this planet and that is something which I think does, does need to be addressed because the, the idea that we can, you know, go about and be libertarian in our behaviour would be great if we weren't, uh, if we were the only species on the planet and didn't need the other species to survive mm. and didn't need to worry about some of those species actually being parasites on us. Now we do. And we, we, we have pushed the, 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 the sustainability of this biosphere well past uh, it, it, it's it's sustainable level, and we are going to pay the price for it. We humans should never have taken over more than a particular fraction of the planet. They should have left a large part of it for the rest of the species that are alive on this planet, and we haven't done it. As one one of my posts, I quoted work by um, a, a, some epidemiologists and and mathematical biologists working out that humans constitute roughly ten times as much of the mass of the mammal species on the planet as other mammals and our our um, livestock are about 20 times our mass so we we far outweigh all the if you add up all the elephants all the lions all the tigers all the wallabies and we are 10 with about 10 times their mass and then our our cows are 20 times our mass that's ludicrous. We've mm. taken up far too much of the planet. We have to. Rest- it can't just be libertarian, democratic. You know, my my. Well, if, uh, if, if this thing we, we talked about this, it. we talked about this on the on the podcast last week, didn't we? I mean, if the, yeah. So if the, if uh, if this is worse than we thought, maybe so that maybe that. But this is part of nature's correction. Let's hope it's not quite so drastic. Just uh, just mm. on the final point, we're we're seeing big spending, obviously, to try and tackle all of this. Uh, people who do, who don't believe in modern monetary theory, who don't think that governments uh, through their central banks can create money, are saying this is going to take a long time to pay back, and and economies are go- we're going to be paying for this uh, longer than we did for the for the global fund. 
financial crisis. Uh, I, uh, do, do you think that will be the case, or do, do I mean Donald Trump is is spending like it's going out of fashion? He has no intention of uh, of paying any of this money back. I mean, he's he, he paid for his he had his tax cuts, then he's had his first tranche of uh, the, his rescue package uh, for the for the virus. Now he wants a two trillion dollar infrastructure project. He has no intention of of, uh, of paying that back. It's not going to hurt the U.S. economy, is it? But uh, but other countries, you mentioned Germany and Europe. Uh, it sounds like they are. They don't need uh, to. This is this is the other crazy thing about it. This whole worry about it, how how are we going to pay for it? You print the bloody yeah. money. Yeah, uh, you and yeah. you and I know that, and regular listeners to this podcast know that. So the, I guess the question is. Yeah, will this, but will, will people st- will everybody else start to realize that now? Will people be looking and saying, "Well, how come how come Donald Trump's not paying any of this money back? How come his debt just keeps on increasing? How come uh, Japan has over two hundred percent of uh, jet, you know government debt to GDP ratio and uh, you know and, and they're still functioning?" Yeah, um, this I don't know that it's actually going to give the um, um, the same uh, you know insights for everybody else, but it should be enough of the. It'd be a bit of a wake-up call. I mean, the, people's capacity not to learn from things like this is still something I'm, I'm, you know, getting used to realizing how little people learn from experience, unfortunately. But uh, yes, it's going to be something that people, the advocates of modern monetary theory can point to and say, "Look, you got that entirely wrong. We there was no need to repay it. Uh, we could produce the money uh, in, as rapidly as we wanted to, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. All these things are going to become more obvious than they were beforehand but i can still people's capacity to hang on to an ideology um despite being it being proven wrong is still something that i i, I don't underestimate unfortunately i can hear the disappointment in your voice <laughs> yeah it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's real it's real mm. but you know if you want a big example this is a huge example i mean it's uh, a, yeah yeah so i mean it's hard to argue against the facts All right, we'll leave it there. Next time, uh, let's look at how the EU has stuffed all this up and uh, whether it actually could be the end of the EU, certainly the end of the euro. Uh, I think think it could be. I'm sure you do too, but we'll talk about that next week. I do. Good talk, Steve. Hey, mate. Actually, we might squeeze in another one before we do that one on the EU uh, because we've got one that's been sitting on the shelf for a while, uh, which we still haven't played, which is one recorded a while ago looking at the work of Adam Smith, the early work of Adam Smith. Is there anything in there, anything at all, which we could take out and say applies to a modern day economy? We'll look at that next time on the Debunking Economics podcast with Professor Steve Keen. I'm Phil Dobby. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.